Okay, here we are. Uh, I am reading Life's Too Short to Pretend You're Not Religious. This is chapter four. I learned it. I learned it by watching you. So if you remember the cheesy drug commercials from the 80s, I learned it by watching you, Dad. <laughs> um, we learn a lot of things um, just kind of growing up and being around things and, and uh, you know, just living our life. Um, the church we attend, the shows we watch, our family, um, school, uh, the, you know, the books we read. Uh, there's a lot that we we take in. And then there's a lot of things that uh, we consciously or and or unconsciously uh, take into our things we believe. Um, in this case, uh, in chapter four, uh, we get a lot. It's really cool. Um, and there's definitely, there's stuff that I feel like flew over my head a little, but um, we're talking a lot about science fiction. There's a whole, there's a whole section on Doctor Who, which is definitely part of my jam. Um, and it kind of talks about the role of science fiction in, you know, being able to step outside of uh, our normal, I guess, modern society and kind of look at it from a different point of view or like projecting into the future um, or seeing, you know, our civilization from the point of view of an alien. I think he talks a little bit about the Twilight Zone uh, in the previous chapter and how Rod Serling would use to talk like Republicans and Democrats, he could just put what they would say into the voice of an alien and it would be something that he could say that maybe they wouldn't be able to say. Um, so uh, it talks a lot about his love for uh, science fiction in this chapter um, and actually looks at some of the things that uh, Doctor Who says. Um, but I, I like the fact that maybe one of the reasons we read science fiction, the reason we watch Star Wars, Star Trek, is that... Um, we want to challenge what what we think. We want to be pushed um, to rethink things, um, and I think I think that's one of the things he's talking about in this chapter. Um, so um, I'm going to point out a few of the uh, quotes and things that I underlined in the book um, that stuck out to me. I like this line. Um, this is a line that that really stuck out to me. The determination to be ever wary of our own peculiar habits of inattentiveness. I, what are the things that I overlook maybe in myself or the things that I hold, um, uh, because of I'm inattentive. I'm not paying attention anymore. It's become a habit. Uh, what are those things? Uh, and, and what am I taking for granted? Um, in other people? What am I missing in other people because I refuse to give attention? I, I refuse to be with someone. Instead, I'm, I'm like a toddler, you know, we're both having a, we're both playing, but we're all in our own world and we're not really <laughs> communicating. Um, or am I aware of the other person and, and trying to hear them and trying, trying to pay attention? Um, that was one that really stuck out to me. Um, and a lot about the importance of just interacting with other people, you know. Um, to receive the witness of another is to enter into a vision that isn't accessible to us in isolation. You can't receive a witness. He, he, there's a word he puts, witness calls for withness other you've got to be with someone to witness them um and um we can't do that in isolation <laughs> how ironic well, not ironic i don't know but we're in isolation right now we're in quarantine we're in lockdown um and to varying degrees we're fighting against that and and some of the re and some people are some people aren't some people are loving the isolation some people are not um I think ultimately a lot of us are pushing back against that isolation because of the desire, even if we're an introvert, um, and I'm not, uh, I think I've developed some introvert qualities over the last few years, but I'm, I'm definitely an extrovert and I'm definitely feeling this um, isolation. Um, but 
to, to really live and to understand what we believe, we need to also be interacting with other people. We can't, uh, I guess, I don't, I don't think we can know God um, in isolation, truly. I think we have to interact with other people to receive that witness. Um, let's see, what's the next one that jumps out to me? There's a verse that is one of the verses that has been with me, uh, a Bible verse that he mentioned several times. Um, being transformed by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Um, if you want to make it back home, you have to keep moving forward, consenting again and again to being transformed by the renewing of your mind, to learning, revising, and resisting once more the bad habit of mistaking your sense of reality for reality itself. There's things that I, because of just the way I've thought about things my whole life, I accept that as that's reality. And that is not necessarily always true. It could be true. Maybe I did have the right grasp of reality, or maybe I have a little tiny piece. There's that story of the, the, the three, I don't know if it's three blind men that are all touching an elephant and like one, if you based, you know, one guy is touching like the tail, one guy is touching the trunk, another guy is touching the leg. And without the full picture, you know, you don't know what the elephant really looks like in reality. You get that one person's, that one person's view or sensation of it because they can just get that little grasp. Um, and, and I think that's a, a great analogy for belief in in God um, is that we're, we have such a small grasp potentially of what, you know, who or what God is. And I think the Bible gives us some of that information. I think a lot of that comes from other people, knowing other people, truly knowing other people, being attentive, being witness to those people. Uh, let's see, let me look at another page here. Um, page 98. Oh, this really jumped out and was sad. Uh, he's, he's quoting Philip K. Dick. He's made a bunch of great science fiction. I think Philip K. Dick was responsible for Minority Report and, and a bunch of other modern re retellings. You, prob you probably know more than I do. Um, this is the quote. He says, If you can float enough disinformation into circulation, you will totally abolish everyone's contact with reality, probably your own included. How many of you feel right now, like your reality has been abolished by disinformation. I, that feels like an exact telling of right now. And I'm sure that was written like in 1970 or something. Um, but I think he saw that coming. Uh, and then finally, this last page, I thought was just, I'm gonna leave you with this. In one of Jesus' strangest and most challenging sayings, he advises his hearers that fullness of life under the reign of God comes down largely to a question of vision. When the eye, being the lamp of the body, is healthy, your whole body is full of light. When it's impaired, darkness. Seemingly straightforward enough, but we wouldn't be wrong to think the teaching could ever end so unparadoxically. The zinger, see to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Luke 11.35. Try that. Might something be amiss in our imagination from time to time? Um, so much so that we're often prone to mistake darkness for light and vice versa? We can, as it turns out, get that wrong. And unlearning the reigning dysfunction we unwittingly inherit and obey isn't something we can pull off overnight. It's an unlearning we're never done doing. Because righteousness is endlessly complicated. We have to have our minds renewed and our thinking transformed continuously like children. Um, so I learned it by watching you. Chapter four. Good, good stuff. Um, I will continue my read through of this book. And maybe you'll join along with me and join me in the conversation and tell me what you're thinking about um, life's too short to pretend you're not religious. Talk to you later.